My Seven Chakras, episode 253. You can have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want. The Seven Chakras, swirling vortices of energy, positioned throughout our body, from the base of the spine to the crown of the head. For thousands of years, this ancient wisdom has been passed on from master to disciple. What are the functions of these energy centers? And could these chakras help you unlock your destiny and find your true purpose? Welcome to My 7 Chakras. And now, your host, Aditya Jai Kumar. What's up, Action Tribe? AJ here, host and founder of My 7 Chakras, the show where we provide you the wisdom and action steps that will help you transform your life. So if you're new to the show, then I want to give you a warm, warm welcome. As a listener, you will receive a lot of information and wisdom to change your life. But if you are like most of our listeners, then I'm pretty sure that you are not just looking for information because if it's only information that you seek, then you can find it on Google. In order to make a progress toward a complete transformation, then you you need a community that will hold space for you, allow you to express your voice, share, collaborate and grow and really step into your new life. And that's why our Facebook community, Action Tribe, is exactly what you need. Our group will hold you accountable provide you feedback and cheer you till the finish line. And we've got a special action action day, which is called a Chakra Challenge every day as well, so that you can take small steps each day and make a big change in your life. So if you want to join the thousands of other members in our group, then go to my 7 forward slash tribe. That's my 7 forward slash T-R-I-B-E. And having said that, Let's bring on our special guest for today, Glenn Livingston. So Glenn, are you ready to inspire? I am always ready to inspire. Wonderful. So thanks a lot for joining us today, Glenn. Glenn Livingston uh, is a veteran psychologist and a longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm which has serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry. Glenn's marketing consulting companies have serviced literally dozens of uh, companies uh, such as AT&T, American Express, Burger King, Citibank, Colgate, Palmolive, Kodak, and Ford Motor Company, to name a few. And that's why I invited him on today's show to learn more from uh, his marketing wisdom and provide our listeners with some advice on growing their business and authentically attracting customers. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, Glenn has been on our show before this. Uh, he appeared on episode number 94. So in case you want to listen to that episode, go to my 7 forward slash 94. But in case you're ready, then let's move on. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us today, Glenn. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to being here. Wonderful, wonderful. So we're going to start with some inspiration like we always do. Uh, my question to you is, what is your favorite inspirational quote these days and how do you apply it to your day-to-day life can i use two of them together oh absolutely so one of them is by a relatively obscure self-help guru named peter peter mcwilliams from the 1980s and he said you could have anything you want but you can't have everything you want you can have anything you want but you can't have everything you want and that quote really encapsulates for me the value of focus because especially in the marketing world, it's very easy to get marketing-itis because you kind of understand how marketing works and you say, I could do this or I could sell that. Mm. And before you know it, you've got 17 different projects and none of them are really getting the um, attention and resources and capital that they deserve. And so you can have anything but you want, but you can't have everything you want. And that's one of them. And the other one, which I think goes hand in hand with it, is Jim Rohn's a life of discipline is better than a life of regret because if you're going to move anything forward in life, you're going to have to have discipline. And if you don't have discipline, you're going to have regret. So focus and discipline over um, regret and ADD is kind of my way of life. And um, how do I apply that every day? I wake up in the morning. I ask myself if I could only accomplish one big thing today, what would that be? What would be the biggest win that I could accomplish in the day? Um, I always start out the day by making some type of vegetable juice or, you know, fruit smoothie. I always start out the day by doing some journaling. 
um, organizing the rest of my priorities for the day. I've got a variety of different things in my routine that, mm -hmm. you know, kind of illustrate the focus and discipline that I, that I look to implement. But, um, yeah, a life of discipline is better than a life of regret, and you can have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want. Wonderful. Thanks a lot for sharing that very profound quote. And it's very relevant to our community, which is called Action Tribe, because uh, to be honest, there are so many things that you can try, so many actions that you can take. But a life of discipline is better than a life of regret, which means that if you're going to do something, then you need to focus, focus and focus. So, Glenn, uh, let's begin. Uh, how did you get started in marketing? Oh, God. <laughs> um a long time ago and i set out to be a clinical psychologist and i never really wanted to be that involved with marketing mm. i was really just going to be like all the other 17 psychologists in my family a guy who sat behind the couch and or you know in front of a couple and helped them to to have a better happier healthier family that's right that's what i really wanted to do in life but um I also had a drive to do more than just a country doctor would do because, you know, as a country doctor, maybe you impact a thousand people on a really deep level over the course of your career. Mm -hmm. But I, I was interested in psychoeducation. I wanted to know, was it possible to help the masses? And I, my dad had been on the radio a little bit, and it was just of interest to me to do that. And probably not a coincidence that I married a marketer. Uh, we're divorced now, but I married a marketer and I was married for 28 years. And um, she was consulting for very large Fortune 100 companies, showing them how to understand consumer purchase motivation and translate that into effective advertising messages. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting. And I had studied a type of um, quantitative research where you could develop protocols to observe the human soul, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. and get concepts like, you know, intimacy or bonding or love and happiness into quantitative format so that you could analyze it with, you know, regressions and statistics and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I taught a course called the multivariate modeling of human behavior and, and I um, saw opportunities to work with certain of her clients who were, um, you know, she did very, very qualitative, soulful, squishy conversations with these companies. Right. Um, and for, it was very interesting. The companies have different cultures. Some companies are really happy with that. Other companies say, no, you really better go out and prove it to me before. Sure. We, yeah. And so I was the guy who, for the companies that really wanted to prove it statistically, I would develop these protocols and implement these. Um, I would implement them on a, on a larger scale. And I started being a consultant myself, and I had my own book of clients. And, um, you know, we actually, over the years, we sold like $30 million of research, a um, bunch of what she did, a bunch of what I did. And um, that's how I got started in marketing. Mm -hmm. I had a, had a little bit of a, disaster along the way where we tried to jump ship and become the subcontractor instead of the study designer because the, the, the research industry is really broken up into two parts and the subcontractors the designers figure out what questions you should ask of the respondents and what cities you should ask them in and right you know and they conduct the whole thing but then there are the subcontractors that go out and get the people to participate and they host the research in their facilities. And so we decided we were going to jump ship and we didn't really know anything about the other side of the industry. Um, and we did it right before 9-11 in New York City, just right. outside New York City, and got absolutely hammered and lost $2 million. And it was, um, it was a real disaster. Um, and then I, I remade myself after that. I decided I didn't want to do the corporate consulting and I started applying what I knew to researching things on the internet mm -hmm. and started a little publishing company and I had a whole bunch of niches and I did really well. And then people heard about that. And so I was asked to start talking about it and I ran around the seminar circuit starting to talk about it and then they wanted us to do it for them. So I started an agency and then I got all these coaching clients. And so for about 15 years, I wound up teaching 
marketing to small businesses, marketing and research to, to small businesses. And, um, yeah, that's kind of my marketing story. Uh, at one, towards the end, just before I got divorced, I got a little tired of teaching, um, mm-hmm. uh, because most of my students were, first of all, not doing anything with it. So I was kind of like an intellectual entertainment. The people who did stuff with it, there was a lot of work involved, but the people who did stuff with it did really well for the most part. Um, and they wound up making a lot more money than I did. Right. And, they, and they had more satisfying careers than I did because they were really pursuing their mission. And I kind of missed being a psychologist and spreading psychological stuff on a grander scale. So I actually wrote a more personal book and I used what I knew to market it. And then it became, became the number one book for a long time. Not, not just one of those little one day things, but like for a year and a half. And um, that, that's what I do now. So now I, now I just kind of, I market that book and I have a coaching program based on it. And um, that's my story in a nutshell. That's what I do. Wonderful. Thanks a lot for sharing your story. And, you know, like you've, uh, you know, suggested our community, our listeners, many of them are either small business owners or they are going to and wanting to start a business. And I think uh, that's where the marketing knowledge and wisdom comes into play. And I thought, who better than you? Uh, of course, if you have the time uh, to come uh, onto our show and share some of your advice, some of your wisdom, so that our listeners can get you know, these pieces of nuggets that they can start to work with. Uh, but to start with the basics, uh, you know, what exactly is marketing and w- why is it important for, for businesses to, to get good at this? What is marketing? <laughs> um, boy, that's, that's kind of like when I was in a, um, I was once in this course on neurology and someone raised their hand and said, what is the brain? And yeah. I, I wasn't quite sure how to answer that. Um, well, I think that ethical marketing hmm. is very much like ethical psychotherapy. It's influencing people with words and images to do something in their best interest. Mm-hmm. And in marketing, it's influencing people with words and images to do something in their best interest on a grander scale. And I think that if you really want to make a difference in the world, and that difference could be moving more product or you know helping more people with the problem that your business solves, that it's very difficult to delegate your marketing um, if you don't understand how marketing really works. And most people think that they understand how marketing works, but they really don't. Right because they've seen a lot of Madison Avenue type advertising and they don't know that a lot of that is not tracked and, um, you know, not, not really accountable. Mm -hmm. Um, and also that most of it is for products that you find in stores already that you already need, like what brand of toilet paper should you use? Mm -hmm. And when there's something that you're buying anyway, and you're walking past it in the store, just feeling really good about it can be enough to get you to choose that brand. And so, a lot of the advertising that you see on television is really feel-good brand advertising um, oh. that, that kind of links your emotions to one brand or another of toilet paper that you're going to buy anyway, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of what small businesses are selling can be things that people don't necessarily know that they need, and not necessarily something you could find in a store. Um, and it's not something that you have $50 million to shout a message really loud. Mm-hmm. It's something that um, you have to be more laser targeted and, um, you know, and work, work directly to get across. So, mm-hmm. um, so I think that m- marketing is the direct effort to convince people to do what's in their best interest anyway, um, using words and images and learning how to do it um, consistently Mm-hmm. learning the difference between there's always a difference between actually solving the problem and marketing the solution of the problem. You'll see this most specifically with healthcare practitioners, right? But because for example, if I work with solid psychologists about how to market their business, they'll tell me something like, well, you know, virtually every psychological problem, whether it's, um, you know, not getting along with your spouse or your kid is not getting good grades or you're depressed or anxious. Most of it can be traced back to a lack of frustration, tolerance, communication skills, and something called object constancy, which is um, a psychological ability to hold a relationship in mind, even in in its absence. Mm -hmm. 
And so most psychologists will want to work on frustration tolerance and communication problems and intimacy and, and um, you know, object constancy. Sure. Or you talk to a chiropractor and they'll say that all of these symptoms are really caused by an imbalance in the skeletal system. And, you know, for most clients, you have to work on rebalancing the skeletal system and maybe some of their nutrition or something like that. Mm-hmm. But when a patient is thinking about seeing a psychologist or a chiropractor, they're not thinking gee, I really need some more frustration tolerance. They're thinking, you know, oh my God, my wife had an affair. Or, oh my God, you know, I'm so depressed I can't get up in the morning. And they, what they want is symptom resolution. Mm -hmm. And, And so whatever you do, you need to be able to wrap your mind, like kind of step outside of the solution that you provide and figure out how you can prove to people that you're the, best person to come to for symptom resolution. Um, so that's, um, I forgot the original question. What, what is marketing? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, I mean, you said it uh, quite right uh, when you said that, you know, many people think they know something, but they actually don't know that. Uh, and that's why I started from the basics to, you know, to really uh, uh, ask you the definition. And I love what you said, which was in, it is influencing people with words and images to make an impact uh, in, in most cases on a grander scale. And the fact that there's a difference between solving a problem and marketing a solution. So a lot of uh, pieces of wisdom right away. Thanks a lot for sharing. Uh, so so what are the foundations of uh, a, a great marketing campaign, if you could? Share well... I would not go into a market again if I didn't have a unique selling proposition. Mm -hmm. And most people think they have a unique selling proposition and they really don't. Like what, what is the reason for people to do business with you as opposed to everyone else in the market? And the foundation of your unique selling proposition, in my estimation, should probably be something contrarian. So you should be able to look at your market and say, all the other vendors in this market are really ignoring one core need of my client. Um, you know, so for example, I have, a, I have a book on restructuring your mind for the right weight loss mindset. And most of the psychology of weight loss books in this market are all about trying to love yourself thin. Right. And, and I get out there and I say, you know what? I wish you could love yourself thin, but the seat of addiction is the lizard brain. And when the lizard brain looks at something in the, in the environment, it says, do I eat it? Do I mate with it? Or do I kill it? And there's no love there. There's no there's no relationships. There's no aspirations. There's no long term goals. It's just eat, mate, or kill. And so you don't need to nurture your inner wounded child back to health before you can stop overeating. You need to capture and cage this rabbit animal and learn how to dominate it like an alpha wolf dominates the omega wolf in the pack. That's what you need to do. Mm-hmm. See, and that that's a unique selling proposition. Not, now I'm gonna I'm going to teach you how to capture and cage the out of control monster inside of you that makes you overeat as opposed to teaching you what everybody else is trying to teach you, which is how to love yourself enough. So you take better care of yourself. So so I I think that you really need a unique selling proposition to, to drive things forward, but that's not enough. Mm -hmm. You have to be very clear about the audience that you're serving. Um, The, clearer you are about the avatar, like if there was only one person that represented your whole audience, the clearer you are about that avatar, the um, stronger your marketing campaign will be. Because when you make that promise that I'm going to teach you how to capture and cage the rabid food monster inside of you so you can stop overeating, Mm -hmm. that promise is going to be much more relevant to a certain audience. So people who have already identified themselves as binge eaters or serious overeaters are going to be most interested in that People who are just inter- interested in general weight loss are going to be less interested in that. So I, I had to decide to go directly after a, um, an audience that was interested in binge eating. But mm-hmm. then if you identify the audience correctly and you've got a very strong, unique selling proposition that's different than everybody else in the market, now they're going to be all excited, but they're not going to believe you. So now okay. you have to have overwhelming proof that you're the one that can actually deliver on this promise. Sure. And that could be case studies, it could be Amazon reviews, it could be, you know, um, celebrity endorsements, it could be scientific research, it could be any of about 30 things. But you really want to start amassing proof that you can deliver this unique promise to this unique audience better than anybody else in the world. Mm -hmm. 
So if you have, those are the three P's, pro problem, promise, and proof. If you've got problem, promise, and proof, then the question is, what kind of an offer are you going to make? Is it, is it irresistible? And what reason are you going to give me to act now? Mm -hmm. um, so if I solve the problem that you have most, if I can do it better than anyone else and I can prove it to you, well, you still want to know, is this affordable? And right. why should I do it now as opposed to putting it off? If you've got those five things in place, and Terry Dean and I coined the term the golden glove for those five things, th then you've got something. If any one of them is missing, then your results are kind of iffy. Got it. Got it's it. easier said than done. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for sharing, uh, Glenn. This this is really really useful. So, Action Tribe, I hope you are taking notes, or maybe if you're in your in your car, you can re-listen or re uh, to this episode later on. But what we're learning is. A, you need a unique selling proposition, something contrarian. Uh, you know, what are people doing in the market? But what are they ignoring? Second, you need your audience. Who's that one ideal customer or that avatar that you want to serve at the highest level? Someone who has that problem that you are able to solve. And then, you know, if you, if you say you can do it, uh, what is the proof? What sort of case studies, testimonials, research do you have that can prove to this avatar uh, that your unique selling proposition, uh, you can really deliver those results? And then finally, you know, they need to take action. You need to uh, give them an offer that really resonates with them. And why should they decide right now as opposed to procrastinating and take, making a decision maybe six months down the line or one year down the line? Uh, Glenn, I think this is really, really useful. Now, my question to you is, You've been in the marketing industry for so many years and you worked with so many different type of clients. Now, with technology, with social media and a different technology, has marketing changed over the years or is it still the same? Well, yes and no. Um, the basic principles haven't really changed. Marketing for most small businesses is really about getting the right people on lists, nurturing them, finding out what they want and giving them what they want. That's that's what marketing is really about. And I still find that email works better than anything else. Um, so everybody thinks that social media is where it's at. You know, how many followers do you have, right. on, have on Facebook? And it's good to have a Facebook following. It's, you know, good to be able to, um, it's good to be able to reach 10,000 people with a post or something like that. But, but by and large, Facebook and Twitter and all of the major social media platforms, it gets harder and harder to reach your following as you go along. Um, and when people are on social media, they're more in the mood to party than they are to buy. Right. Um, and you are reaching them. So you're reaching them in the wrong mood and you're reaching them when they're talking to so many other people. Whereas when you reach them in their email, they're, very specifically focusing on one correspondence at a time and um, you know, and you're much more likely to get them to read your, your whole message. So I, I still find that, I mean, for 20 years, people have been saying email marketing is going to go away because there's so much right. spam and it just doesn't. I, st I still find that when all the naysayers come out, I just make plans to make more money with email and I keep making more money with email and email is really where it's at. Um, there are more vehicles to reach people. I mean, you can – paid advertising on Facebook works reasonably well depending upon what your offer is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so – and it's nice that, you know, Facebook is providing Google with a run for its money as some competition. Right. Because um, for a lot of years, Google was the place to reach people, and we all just thought the price was going to go up and up and up. Um, but by and large, I – you know, I found that um, – I learned these core marketing principles and I've been able to make them work without learning an awful lot more about new media and all that kind of thing. So I just, I don't panic about all the latest, greatest shiny objects. I just um, right. get people on lists, find out what they want, give them what they want. Well, thanks a lot. And, and it totally makes sense uh, based on what you're sharing. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm learning is that at the end of the day, uh, you need to get people onto your email list because you have so many different social media platforms and many more to come. But at the end of the day, you don't own those platforms, right? But you do own your email list and uh, you can communicate directly with your customer. But also when people are on social, they're there just to party. They're just, just to have conversations and not really to buy. Whereas if you want to sell something and you have a great product, great offer, then email is the platform. Exactly. 
Got it. Got it. Now, Glenn, you've con- uh, you know uh, you've created and developed some great terms over the years, like you've shared a while back, the golden glove. Uh, but something that really uh, you know caught my mind and is a wonderful term is the hyper responsive customer. Yeah, you know. So so, uh, what exactly is the hyper responsive customer? Could you talk to us a bit more about that? Well, it's derived from the eighty twenty principle, and if if you look at the if you look at the um, like cost the, the income distribution um, yeah. in your business. I don't mean the income of your customers. I mean the income that they give you, how much they pay you. You'll probably find that 20% of your customers are responsible for 80% of your profits. And if you would look within that 20%, you'll find the same rule applies. So 20% of that 20% is responsible, responsible for 80% of the 80% or, you know, roughly about 4% of your customers is, um, responsible for gosh 64 60 the the way i like to think of it is about five percent of your customers is responsible for more than half your profit Mm -hmm. and we call those customers hyper responsive and there is a while in my career when i dedicated my research abilities to identifying who those hyper responsive customers were because i found that they left clues so if you surveyed them and you asked them open-ended questions they would leave longer more detailed and passionate responses Mm-hmm. So I I remember um remember a survey about guinea pigs where I was just trying to figure out how to write a book about guinea pigs and I asked people what the most important question was and why they wanted to know and so a regular person might say well I want to know how long guinea pigs live um and the reason is because my uh, I want to get one for my kid a hyper responsive customer says I want to find out exactly how long guinea pigs live and what you can do to make them live longer and the reason is that I bought my son a hamster and that thing died within three months and it was awful. I don't want him to have a traumatizing experience like that again ever. So I um, you know, really need to figure out how to get a long-lived animal and what I can do to maximize the longevity. And so you get these long-winded, um, passionate answers where you could really feel the emotion behind yeah. it. So that, there were some things like that. Um, you know, they'd be more willing to talk to you on the phone afterwards. They would fill out surveys at a higher percentage rate. So if 100 people came to the page, you know, for a particular keyword term and you asked them to take a survey, a higher percentage would fill it out if that keyword term represented customers that were more hyper-responsive than others. And so, so I started to look at how you could analyze surveys and how you could do Um, you know, qualitative research with the customers that were likely to mean the most to you in the business and um, actually came up with a scoring system. And then we would, um, you know, we would focus on looking for a USP that surrounded the hyper-responsive customers. Mm -hmm. So, so, so this is, this is really, really useful because uh, like you mentioned, if someone is taking the time to, write down these lengthy responses to questions that you asked as opposed to someone who says yes i want that or yes i'm interested in that you pretty much know that this person has that problem right and and uh, would really benefit from the solution that you're able to provide in your business so keeping this in mind what should a business be owner be doing more of or less of to attract these hyper responsive customers well you should be doing more research into your own list so you should you should um, take a look at the people who bought from you in the last year and look at the 5% of people that are responsible for half the profits and get someone on the phone with them, probably the business owner, and find out, hey, what what problem were you trying to solve when you came to us and what was it about our solution that really worked for you and is there anything that we could have provided that we didn't and you know, do you remember shopping around for a similar solution? Is there anything you couldn't find elsewhere? And you know, just kind of dig for, um, dig for that USP that mm-hmm. would really make you stand out to those customers. Because mm-hmm. I, I work on the theory that if you sell to the hyper-responsive customers, that you're going to stand out to the others also. It's kind of like if you create a really bright star in the solar system, it's going to attract, you know, it's going to have a higher center of gravity and attract um, more planets and things from around it than if you are just kind of have a diffuse center of gravity and you don't really have a bright mm. star so 
Well, absolutely. What comes to my mind is, you know, uh, with companies these days, you know, creating new products, uh, they tend to sell to the early adopters, right? The ones who are the fastest to go to the company and say, yes, I want to try out that prototype. But these these companies are actually creating products for the early early adopters, but then everyone, uh, the mainstream in the end, ends up using these products and that's how they become very successful, right? So. Yep, I agree. Got it, got it. And now, uh, Glenn, uh, you know, persuasion goes hand in hand with marketing, right? You've written about some amazing persuasion principles that people can use in their marketing campaigns to attract uh, customers. Uh, could you share some of these uh, principles with us or maybe talk a bit about it? Well, I was talking off an, an awful lot about it before when you're asking me what marketing was, the the golden glove, the principles of persuasion, um, mm -hmm. problem, promise, proof, uh, irresistible offer, and a reason to act now. Um, the thing that I tend to use more than other marketers tend to use are demonstrations, especially when you're talking about human service. Okay. So I, I sell a lot of coaching. And if you were to get onto my list, then I'll, I'll tell you at the end how to do that. If you get onto my list, I would send you literally over the course of a year more than 100 demonstrations. So mm -hmm. I, I just decided when I started marketing in this arena that I was going to get one or two coaching clients a week to let me record a session with them. And I was going to distribute it on my blog and in a podcast and in an email. And I find that that's more effective than anything else at generating sales um, because it's rather than having someone else say that I'm really good or getting testimonials and people wondering or having to read the testimonials. It's like, yeah. look, you can sit on in a session with me. You can see exactly how I work and the results that I achieve. You can, you can hear the excitement in the client's voice. You can feel the transformation. This is what I do. This is, this is what my coaches do. Um, this is what I have to sell. And so those demonstrations have been just a godsend for me. And it's always been a really giant part of my marketing formula. Um, and I also, you know, once I get people on my email list, I send them email until they buy or die. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't like it's it's very cliche for people to say, oh, I'm sending valuable content. But no, I, I really do send a yeah. tremendous amount of value. I mean, I, I I put hours into those coaching demonstrations. I get experts to interview kind of like you're doing here. Um, and you know, at least twice a week, I'm putting that out to kind of mix in with the sales messages. And I, I find that if I don't, the sales drop dramatically as do the open rates and click-through rates, just lose the attention on the list. So I think of it like running a radio show. Um, yeah. and, and I only get to advertise because I have a really good radio show. Otherwise, otherwise, I'm not allowed to get a commercial because people aren't going to listen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, so thanks a lot for sharing that, Glenn. So many useful things, Action Tribe. I hope you are listening. If you don't have an email list, start collecting emails. And not only that, make sure you take surveys so that you can get to know and find out who that hyper responsive customer is. Uh, don't uh, uh, you know think twice if you have to get that person on the call as well, because these conversations are going to be critical. And the other thing is demonstrations or just testimonials uh, because testimonials uh, demonstrations if you have if, if it fits for your business uh, can show your prospective customers the excitement uh, the reactions and will help you sell your uh, your products for your small business as well do, do you know what works that people don't do enough that I really haven't done enough myself um, like B and C level celebrity endorsements like mm. um, you know you, I think for $9,000, you could hire Mr. T to help mm. endorse your product. And so there's a part of me that's been thinking, I want to I wanna hire Mr. T, Mr. T to let me coach him. I want to record a coaching session with Mr. T. Yeah. I want him to go, I pity the fool who don't use Glenn's coaching methods. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that, that kind of stuff actually works when I've seen clients do it. It's just um, people don't think to do it and they don't realize that it's not as expensive Right. Or, or I thought maybe I'd hire Adam West, the original Batman, and then I, yeah, could, then yeah. I could put out a note that said, I coach Batman. Yeah, because he has, I'm sure he has like a cult following, a group of followers that will swear by whatever he does, right? Well, and he doesn't have to be the cult follower. It's no. just people that remember who he was and say it was cool. It's an attention getter. And it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a little bit of extra credibility. So um, that's something that I, I'm going to start doing more of soon. Oh, absolutely. And what comes to my mind when, when you said this was, have you seen the movie The Room? No. 
Okay, so Room is all over the news these days because uh, James Franco made a remake of that movie, but this movie released sometime in, in the 2000s. Uh, Tommy Wiseau was the actor, and apparently it was one of the worst made films, uh, technically, but because of certain things that they did over the years, it has developed such a cult following, uh, uh, not only in the USA, but all over the world as well. Uh, but the other thing is, I remember he did a lot of uh, these uh, commercials with these brands, unknown brands, uh, but but it seemed like they worked pretty well. <laughs> yeah, interesting. interesting. Yeah, but do check out the room. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's pretty good. Uh, so, Glenn, when I told my community, when I told my audience that I'm going to be interviewing you, many of them were really excited. They wanted to learn more about uh, you, especially since uh, you appeared on our show uh, the first time around. So do you mind if we go through some questions from our community? Sure. Great. Okay. So Amanda H says, I live in a small community. What are some effective ways to market my business? Many people regularly read the weekly newspaper, uh, but what are some effective ways to get uh, the name of my business out to more people, uh, especially do, in my community? Do you know what she sells? Uh, I did not check. Our, our um, if you could do local workshops and demonstrations, that's an effective way to do it. Um, go, going to going to universities and libraries and hospitals and temples and mosques and churches and seeing if you can talk to their audience and give a demonstration, come up with an interesting title. Um, so I don't know, suppose you sell blenders. Mm -hmm. You say... Um, you know, new superpower blender. Watch me, watch me blend better than a wood chipper. I, I don't know what it would be, yeah. um, but you go, go out and give workshops and demonstrations. And when you're there, engage the audience. Don't just show off, but ask questions about why they came and what they were hoping to learn, and if they had any hesitations, and get them talking. Um, and then they'll be more likely to engage with you afterwards. Got it. So, Amanda, I hope that question, uh, that response answers your question. Uh, uh, demonstrations, local workshops, and getting the conversation going locally. Uh, so, Glenn Candy has this question. She says, it's been a challenge for me to place a monetary value on my time and service. Now, I'm of the mindset that I, I will not barter my service. Instead, I gift them. I do not offer any discounts because I do not discount my energy when in session, whether I receive monetary or energetic compensation. What is your opinion on price setting and discounts or freebies? Now, just to provide some context, I believe Candy is in the, in the yoga space. So she's a yoga teacher and, and yeah. community leader. So, so I've supervised a lot of coaches in different markets to develop a personal practice like this. And what, mm -hmm. I, what I tell them is that in the beginning, you really need to trade dollars for experience because, because um, it can take hundreds of sessions and dozens of people to get really, really good at what you do and also to develop a referral base. Like pr Practices really thrive on referral bases. If you're not... If you're not, if you don't have a professional marketing campaign and you're not, you know, paying a lot of money for, you know, pay-per-click advertising, and you don't, you're not really someone who's willing to take those kind of risks, then, um, you know, it's really those sessions, the number of sessions you do that's going to determine your long-term success. And most coaches get a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, understandably, because they give them a tremendous amount of energy and time and they feel like their time should be worth money. Right. But your time is worth what someone will pay for it. And in the beginning, if the demand isn't there, then it's not there. Um, and the coaches that I found to be most successful, they'll go out and do hundreds of sessions in the beginning and basically whatever the client really can afford to pay. Uh, maybe their regular fee is 100 and this client can't really afford more than 60 or this client could afford $50 every other week, whatever it is. Just do the work, do the work, do the work. Um, and then the demand will come along. And when the demand comes along, you'll have no problem raising your price. You'll have to because you won't have enough time to, to do otherwise. So that's what I would say with that. That's what I would say with that. Got it. And I'm sure, Candy, you want to be in that phase where the demand is so high that you just have to uh, raise your price. So I hope that uh, response no, uh, was serving you. No, let me give you an example. When I started yeah. my practice, I was a PhD right. and I had done projects where I'd made as much as $1,000 an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was worth a lot of money, 
but I wasn't worth a lot of money in the psychology space because um, I didn't have all these insurance plans that everybody wanted to pay with because this was just when managed care was coming into vogue. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really known in the clinical psychology space on Long Island. And so I, I called up all of the psychologists on Long Island and I said, you know, do you have any patients that you don't like working with? Um, can I see patients for you? I don't really care what you pay me. Um, and I worked it out to see people as low as $25 a session. And I just, within 18 months, I had $100,000 a year practice doing that. Um, you know, start, starting from scratch with a PhD. But the first six months, I had a lot of patients that paid 25 bucks. I had one client that paid a dollar. She came three times a week. She paid me a dollar. Um, it didn't matter to me. What mattered to me was getting the experience, getting the referral base rooted in the community, getting moving. That's what mattered to me. Wow. This is, this is some really useful life advice, not just marketing. So thanks a lot for sharing that. Now, Heather H. from our community has some uh, thinking that she's doing out of the box, right? So she says, is print media like direct mail worthwhile? Uh, is it still worth the cost? I'm not sure anyone is doing that anymore. Um, very much so, but I'm not necessarily the expert to answer that question because I don't do a lot of that. Um, mm -hmm. The guy I refer to is Dan Gallopu, Doberman Dan. He he worked with he lived with Gary Halbert for a while. He was a good friend of mine, and um, it is he he runs entire businesses based upon that kind of thing. So I know for certain that it's working. I don't have enough clients that are doing it that I can. Um, really speak to it with effectiveness. Got it. Uh, so Glenn, uh, our final question is from Dahlia M. She says, what is the best way to approach large companies to do independent consulting or offer a service to their employees? It's hard. There are a lot of gatekeepers. Um, the way that I did it, I don't know if it's the best way, but the way that I did it was I went to trade shows and I, I paid to speak at those trade shows. And I got some people that were interested like that. Um, I got lists of um, lists of the officers in marketing and marketing research. And I found out who their secretaries were. And I called to develop relationships with the secretary. I would stop by when I could to talk to the secretaries. And they'd introduce me to some people. And just over time, I kind of worked my way in. It's more of a cold selling approach. I, I think that um, Doberman Den would tell you that, no, you don't do that. You write them a FedEx and you, um, mm -hmm. you know, send them some kind of crazy lumpy mail and you send it to all of their peers so that they feel like, you know, who is this guy? And, um, but I, that's not the way that I did it. I, I, you know, I, I pursued the secretaries and I offered to do lunch and learns and every now and then I'd get in and, the other way is to be really, really good. Cause like once I would get in word would spread around cause I was really, really good. So, you know, you don't want to push really hard to get in and not, not have something that really wows them. You have to make sure you're going to wow them when you get in. But, um, right. yeah. So Glenn, uh, thanks a lot for sharing, uh, you know, those pieces of advice, uh, the strategies that you've shared really, really useful. What is it one action step that you'd recommend for someone listening right now who wants to either start a business or grow their business using the marketing principles that you've shared? Well, there are two different, two separate questions. If you want to grow your business, I would ask myself, how can I gather more proof that I solve this problem better than anybody else? Okay. And, and what additional backend offer can I provide that I'm not providing yet? Uh, I would ask my customer base, what can I do for you that I haven't done for you yet? And I find a lot of existing businesses spend way too much time trying to optimize their advertising or convert more front end customers when the money is much more in the back end. That's fairly traditional advice, but it's still very true. If you're trying to start a business, I would focus very much on who the audience is that I want to sell to. Um, and, you know, we could do another call sometime about all of the criteria you would look at in terms of search volume and monetization and competition and things like that. But, yep. but basically, um, you need to figure out who the audience is that you're selling to first and foremost, and then other things start to come into place. Um, I think that audiences are defined by search keywords. 
So if there was one and only one search keyword, the bullseye keyword in the market, what search keyword would you advertise on? Like who represents the ideal customer who is already convinced that they need a service like yours or a product like yours and they're just trying to decide which one should it be? Um, you know, so I'd figure out that bullseye keyword and define my audience like that. And then once you do that, you can very easily narrow down who the real competitors are, like who's advertising most consistently above the fold. Um, and then see if you can re reverse engineer what they're doing and whether you have the resources and inclination to at least match them um, and otherwise choose another bullseye. So that's how I would start a business. So Action Tribe, to read the entire show notes for today's episode, including the inspirational quote, the book recommendation, and certain pieces of wisdom that you might not have been able to capture right away, visit my7chakras.com forward slash 253. That's www.my7chakras.com forward slash 253. Now, Action Tribe, today was a different kind of episode. We don't usually explore concepts like marketing on our show, but recently I found out that this is what our audience wants. Conscious marketing is very much part of opening our heart chakra, our throat chakra, and ultimately our crown chakra as we go beyond just profits and revenue to finding out how our businesses will impact the world. Because unless a business, and by extension, unless you are making a positive impact on earth, unless you're leaving the earth a little bit better than how you found it, you will always find that there's something missing in life and that's where the concept of finding your purpose comes in uh, you know why you've been put on this earth how will you solve some of the challenges that people are facing today you know so what gets you excited what uh, lifts your spirit and what gets you going even if it's 3 uh, a.m in the morning uh, action tribe to win the game of life i found out that you need three things a definite purpose of how you will serve the world, the knowledge and wisdom of how to get there, that's what we're getting today, and a deep-rooted desire to get there no matter what. And this is something that I learned from the author of Think and Grow Rich, the one and only Napoleon Hill, who said there is one quality that one must possess to win, and that is definiteness of purpose, the knowledge of what one wants, and a burning desire to possess it. So Glenn, as on today, what is your life's mission? What is your life's purpose? At this point, I'd like to help 1 million people a year to stop binge eating. That's, that's my primary focus. Um, and we're getting there. <laughs> we're, we're getting there. So that, that's what I'm, um, that's what I'm working at. Got it. And since we have arrived at the last round for today, we've, uh, we, uh, I'm going to ask you about four questions like the wisdom round last time. I'm not sure if you recall, uh, but this is basically an opportunity for our listeners to guess, get some more uh, pieces of wisdom Bring it on. from you. Bring it on. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. So what is the best piece of advice that someone has ever given you? Hmm. The fundamental decision in life is to choose whether to get even or get well. And people give lip service to saying, oh, I would never, never get even. I'm not a vengeful person. But when you look at how they organize their life and how they pursue their energy, um, you really do see that people are making a fundamental decision about whether to get even or get well. And hands down, getting well is a better choice. So name one personal habit that keeps you going these days. Um... I do yoga four times a week. Wonderful. So what is your morning routine like? Do you have something like a morning routine these days? I do. I usually get up and I talk to my girlfriend for a little bit and then I go off to yoga and sometimes I'll go off to CrossFit. Um, oh, I will make a big giant banana green smoothie before I go, drink half of it before I go, half of it afterwards. Uh, I'll come back and I will try to journal for a half an hour. I don't always have the time, but I really try to do that. Um, I will figure out what my single biggest win for the day that I'm going after is, and then I'll hit the ground running. Awesome. So name one book that you'd like to recommend for our community today. Um, I would say How to Live an Inspired Life by Jim Rohn. 
Got it. Got it. Thanks a lot for sharing. We'll have that up in the show notes. Action Tribe, I know how much you love the books shared on our show. And that's why audible.com is giving all our listeners an opportunity to get one free audiobook download so that you can start listening to books instead of going through them page by page. Right. So uh, Audible, in case you don't know, has thousands of books to read, including the Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle, and The Chakra System by Anadia Judith. To get your free book, go to my 7 forward slash free book. Once again, that's my 7 forward slash free book to start listening. So Glenn, thank you so much for joining us once again on today's show. It was really, really amazing and inspirational to learn from your marketing wisdom. Uh, before you go, tell us one thing that you're grateful for and how can we find you online? Well, I'm grateful for you and your show and thank you for having me on. Maybe that's cheating, but I am. Um, and you can find me at neverbingeagain.com. Get a free copy of the book that I vaguely referenced as we talked about it. Um, it's a weird book, by the way. It involves fighting your inner pig um, to teach yourself how to how to stick to the diet of your choice. Um, so if that's going to offend you, please don't do it. But otherwise, go to neverbingeagain.com. You can study my marketing system. It's pretty strong. Um, you'll also get a set of food plan templates, and you hear some of those coaching demonstrations so you can see how I do what we talked about, and you can get a sense of the the USP. Um, and I, I do email a lot, by the way, so feel free to unsubscribe if you don't want it. Um, but it would be good for you to see as a marketer how that's all done. NeverBingeAgain.com. So there you go, Action Tribe. If you want to learn more about uh, Glenn and also are curious about this book, uh, then go to NeverBingeAgain.com. If you want to learn more about that topic, then we did an episode on that, my 7 forward slash 94, so that you can learn more about this particular topic, binging. Uh, Glenn, thank you so much for coming on our show, talking to us about authentic marketing principles and taking us one step closer to a human revolution. Very good. Thank you, Aditya. You are listening to My 7 Chakras. Go to my S-E-V-E-N chakras.com. Download your free gift, get inspired, and take action. Transform your life today.